Okay, so um, we are moving from um, speaking at you to ruthlessly recruiting you all to help us in a project we've got going. So um, I'll explain that as we go along. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday. Just to give you a sense, uh, the modern era, um, I, was, I was in this extraordinary uh, uh, environment in Amsterdam where everybody dresses up in these medieval gowns and... Uh, they had this wonderful concept of an exaugural lecture there. So a, a retiring professor, after a lifetime of work in the field, tells everybody what they kind of make of it all and that it's all going to hell in a handcart. And actually, it seems to me such a much more interesting idea than inaugurals when you go in and you barely know uh, how things might shape up. Um, a year ago, we were, um, we were in the um, um, University of Southern California and... Uh, Apparently, I don't know whether there's any photographic evidence of the first network workshop. Uh, there's some doubt as to whether it really happened, uh, Woody was telling me, and it's just a figment of some people's uh, imagination. <laughs> but, but clearly, from, from, from a smaller group, we have progressed to uh, a larger group, so this feels like something interesting is happening. And a year ago, I was talking to you about this phenomena, which is definitely seems to be happening in an interesting way. And... Um, this is relevant to this web index in a certain sense, in that there is something happening in this web of linked open data which might even be uh, an interesting feature of any index as we go forward. We'll, we'll debate that. Um, and a number of us have been busy in the meantime trying to, and I again mentioned this last year, we were engaged in the process of getting government to open up its data. Um, in the UK, we've been releasing very fine-grained crime data across the whole country. Uh, we've been linking data together, everything from bus stops to ministers. And these are new kinds of networks, and they are going to have some very interesting properties. And I just, we begin to see, I think, in the work that a number of people are doing here, uh, um, the stuff on scientific visualization, the opportunities for kind of understanding these networks. Um, there will be lots of effects in there to think about and ruminate on. And the segue into this next piece is... One of the challenges us, for us is to understand how if something like open government data on the web in a particular format takes off, becomes viral, how do we measure that impact? How do we understand it? How do we characterize it? The more general uh, question, though, is it derives from a project that the Web Foundation, which is a relatively new um, foundation uh, headquartered actually in Geneva but also uh, in, in the US for tax purposes as well uh, uh, very wisely um, and, and for which uh, Tim um, uh, was keen to have founded was uh, actually established under a number of uh, grants from people like MacArthur and Knight um, and the whole purpose of the Web Foundation is to try and understand how to promote the beneficial effects of the web for society and the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, which worries about standards is associated with this effort, as is the Web Science Trust in trying to understand the research that needs to be done. And one of the things that the foundation is doing, it's acting as a, as, as, as a place where certain sorts of philanthropic funding, certain sorts of kind of important project that relate to the impact of the web on society kind of come together. And what has happened is that there's a going to be a project kicking off with funding um, to a reasonable extent to try and create this concept of web index. Now, the curious thing about this is that people believe this is the right thing to do, it's being funded, uh, but nobody necessarily understands how to do this at all. Okay, so we are ruthlessly looking to exploit the brains in this room to tell us how, uh, whether, uh, and what it might be. So the notion is... Um, and how much is it, uh, this is public, uh, Tim, in terms of who's the size of this thing? Or is it, we, we just say it's a project in progress. It's a project in progress. Right, okay, okay. But there will be a uh, resource behind this. The notion is trying to understand the, the impact of the web in various countries around the world in all of its various forms and how that might evolve over time. So that's the top level uh, ambition. And what we're trying to do, uh, the reason that the Web Sciences Trust has got involved, is we're trying to uh, help establish what the science, engineering, and methods might require to run such a thing um, if what we're trying to understand is how, what's the state of the web, how it's growing, 
uh, not just as a piece of technology, but it's, if you like, societal impact. So that's, that's the context. There is no more context than this. Basically, uh, um, Jim Hendler and I was, uh, were partly tasked with thinking about how we might get, if you like, a um, research-oriented perspective on this to feed into the requirements and ideas about this. And we said, well, if we could just hijack a piece of the network uh, science meeting, wouldn't that be perfect? Because there are people there who have thought about these things rather seriously, one suspects, in a variety of contexts. So that's going to be almost all the talking I'm going to do. Um, well, of course, sadly not for you, but um, that not, um, uh, this is mainly going to be interactive. Now, Guys, let me throw one yeah. very quickly. The other thing that might be of interest to people in this room is that another report back on this will be going as part of the NSF. Um, so again, some, of the, some funding for this meeting came from an NSF proposal, an uh, NSF eager, I won't go into detail. Suffice to say that our report back on that will include some stuff about the index, so we're also hoping to get them interested in sort of the scientific community, backfill stuff, what needs to be collected, how, what would people need to be doing yeah. as part of a research agenda to make something like that go forward. Okay, so we, and we've got an hour. We can run till uh, um, 11.45. We have a Twitter channel open, which can be sometimes a good place to post resources that we haven't thought of, like you should look at this website, look at this paper. Um, so we can use that, those people who want to use that. Um, I hopefully thought we'd be using an IRC channel to kind of, but nobody uses IRC. We discovered that last night. So, uh, but it is being recorded and transcribed. So your ideas and contributions will be captured. So uh, the first part of the homework is this. Um, I mean, this is perhaps a little bit, well, there's going to be one, <laughs> probably. Um, but uh, it would be quite interesting to hear people's views on that first question. Should we have an index like this? What should its ambition and purpose be? What do other indices teach us? So um, everything from you know, the state of democracy across the world through to economic indices of development of various sorts. Um, there are a variety, you know, the peace index, I know of these efforts, you will know of many more. Um, so what we would like to spend the first quarter of an hour, 20 minutes thinking about is this thing, why? What is the why? And what are the perils of um, perhaps arbitrary quantification or whatever such an index could be as well? So um, thoughts, just, just we need to start this off. People just come and say, this is the worst idea I've ever heard. I'm not responsible for the idea. I'm trying to moderate a way through it, he says quickly. Do I see anybody who wants to pitch in? Karen? Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, I. We're gonna, there's going to be quite a lot of shuttling about, so you need to be quick off the. So, first of all, um, I think it's a great idea, not not bad one. Um, actually, uh, I was approached by two different governments that were asking me for something similar because they wanted to accumulate and gather data for local purposes. Now, obviously, it changes from one country to another, right? Why do you want to create those kind of indices? And, and, and obviously, the context here plays a big role. But I think the knowledge, the, the ability to basically transparently uh, bring locally, and again, I'm putting the emphasis on the locally, uh, a lot of knowledge that right now is dispersed in different kind of databases and different kinds of the minds of people, and sometimes it's led and it's not even, you know, uh, exposed or, or transparent at all. That by itself has a relevance locally. Then I'm thinking also about internationally, obviously, is, is the ability, obviously, to connect those those uh, bits and bytes of, of knowledge. Yeah. I mean, yeah. then we can start talking again about collaboration. So that's an interesting question, the extent to which is this would be region specific or global and what the trade offs are there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me, I'll point at people. <laughs> Thanks, Nigel. I've got two questions. First of all, um, can you. Just a quick Google yeah. search turns up several yeah. similar projects. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this is distinctive. And secondly, um, how will you be incorporating, rather than building something completely from scratch, how will you be incorporating existing tools and technology, sort of plug and play work? Because there's a lot of stuff out there that, that can be used yeah. to index the web, whether it's you know on social media or whether it's on different countries. So I was wondering about those two things. Well, absolutely, a good, good point. I mean, um, and of course, there are people who make a profession and, and a living out of whether it's the Economic Intelligence Unit or whoever, uh, the, economy, uh, uh, the, the, the Economist publication, for example, does a lot of this work. There are web indexes. We don't think anything does it 
We don't know what dimensions we want to include at this stage. So one of the things that we may well do is simply say, well, there's a good stable characterization of this aspect of the web. For example, uh, general penetration, uh, the extent to which it's available in one platform or another, um, um, the amount of uh, uh, ISP activity. One could imagine these things that are already being collected quite well, and one wouldn't want to necessarily, well, you wouldn't want to replicate that probably if you were able to use the data in an open way. There is one actual, um, I believe, we'd like to make a basic principle of this is that the data going into this has to be open data. So I, I don't know whether that will, actually that's an assumption I suppose, we should test it, perhaps it will. Uh, of course many indices of this sort end up having a sell on value or some aspects of the measures going into it have some proprietorial context. And I'm, again, experience issues around that would be interesting. So yeah, other, yes, uh, Louis. Um. I think all of us will agree that these things are great. Um, but I, I have one worry about working on a single index. I, I think starting with a package of indices would be uh, more useful. The, the reason why I'm saying this is that um, if you start pushing one and it gets adopted, then it can take a life of its own and, and push, create the wrong incentives. I mean, uh, I'm thinking about the current obsession with GDP growth as if that was the single m measure of people's happiness or, or, or something like that. And so once right. I'm thinking about different indexes for the web, I'm thinking about things about gender balance in, in use of resources or uh, economic diversity or uh, ethnic diversity in who are using uh, uh, or kind of the concentration of sources. Is everybody just going to Google or actually a large number? So, so I'm sure uh, this will come down to the methodology. So, I mean. The idea of, the idea of, uh, the idea of uh, the idea of a, of a big index is it can obviously have lots of components to it. My assumption was that it can change with time. Mm -hmm. So, at some point where the web index is at 10,412. We can we, that we we say it's going to stay at 12,412, but we're going to change the mix. So I assume that that, that will uh, that the we will spot things as uh, as you do. We might find that this that uh, if there's a large component coming from something, which ends up driving we'll come motiv this later, motivating it some, something in appropriate yeah. place. Uh, so I, th I think the issue about and also in something fast evolving as the web, how do you normalize the web so you can even look back and say was are we even index? Does this index mean anything like it does uh, now in but 10 years time? I think the, the exciting thing is that this is g gives us a chance to uh, this is a value judgment. What goes into the index? If, you know, if, if we if you only have one index of your packages, which are the ones which you, how are you going to weight them? You know, so when, as you weight the packages which go in there, you're saying this is if we if the web were perfect, this is what it would be like. And that's a huge statement to make. So input. Yeah. Yeah. Put on Sorry, Rob. Rob. Um, yeah, just the point about weighting the various components of an index. Um, I mean, the, the, the point was made over here about well, why is there such a big focus on GDP per capita um, while there's all these other, uh, you know, um, human development is, is a multi-dimensional uh, thing. But the reason, one of the reasons why there is this big focus on GDP is because it's, it can be quantified in a valid way and um, it can be compared across countries and acr over time. Um, and that's sort of what e the economic theory of index numbers has, provi has provided. And once you start moving into a multi-dimensional, like um, aggregating across various dimensions uh, to come up with a single index, then y you get to this problem that it's already been mentioned about arbitrariness. You know, how, how, do, you de how do you determine the weights? And the it becomes contested. Um, and, and the World Development Index, for example, which is, which is a, a, a sort of a, an aggregation of, a ver of various uh, dimensions of human welfare, th th one of the things that always gets uh, talked about is the fact that you know, how are the weights de de uh, derived, so it's just something that's going to be an issue. Okay, yep. Um. Yeah, Peter. It, yeah, according to the, uh, the, the leaflet, um, this index should have at least two different aims. One is uh, measuring the diffusion of the web uh, globally in different ways, but the other one is to um, uh, identify the opportunity to increase the web's social and economic impact. I think that are two completely different goals. Okay. And for the first one, of course, you could think of, of an index, and 
I would also argue then for multidimensional one and, and don't try to, to, uh, to bring it all back to one figure. Uh, but for the second one, that, re that uh, um, reminds me to the question of the societal impact of science, which is also such a uh, difficult to, uh, to measure thing. And if you don't understand how science creates impact or how the World Wide Web creates impact in many different forms, then we, would, then we don't know what to measure or, and how to create an index. So I think it's much too early to ask for an index for measuring the societal impact of the web. But, but should, we do, should we not do some work on thinking what that Question yes, of course. Means. Yeah, yeah, but 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 an index then is uh, is still far away. What would you call that enterprise? I can imagine many different, as part of web science, many different types of projects to study impact of of the World Wide Web, the societal or the economic impact of the World Wide Web. But in general, that would be very focused on specific types of impact in specific societal. Uh, areas, etc. So that would be a huge, a huge amount of work. But if you do diffusion on the web, diffusion of the web, which is the first question, yes. don't you? In asking that question, how do you stop it not just being how many people have got access to browsers or how many? I mean, that question doesn't that question? But, but I think that's exactly what other indices teach us. That many of these indices that 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 are provided by statistical offices are not very useful to understand the di so the social dynamics. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, depending on what, yeah. what you're interested in. Okay. Yeah. Richard. Yeah. I don't know if it's as interesting um, to make an index or to make an index maker. Right. Um, Go on. Because, I mean, I've made I've made a, um, a world social uh, issue index um, online. Um, and it's just a technique, and it's relatively simple. Um, and a lot of people have followed it and 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 made indices themselves. So the way I did it was I took a, a, a like like if you do an inflation index, I took a basket of NGOs um, and then watched what sort of social issues they were campaigning for, and then watched that over time and got an indication of like. You know what kind of world attention is being paid to which social issues right. by issue professionals instead yeah. of by newspapers, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know. But I mean, it's more of a package that I created, um, sort of method, technique, <coughs> means of delivery. Um, so more like an index maker. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Karen. Um, I, I want to give a little bit of the experience that we had uh, in the UN regarding uh, the Digital Divide Index, which was uh, for years they've been struggling with that uh, because in the first years they were creating something that was very simple. And in a sense, it was basically measuring the simple uh, infrastructure measurement that everybody could, could basically get anywhere. And when they got into sophisticated things, then, then it became very problematic because not all the countries exhibited those sophisticated things. So going back to one index, it can be one index, but maybe the ability to, again, for different contexts, different countries, different localizations, get different factors, different measurements, and that such an index then can be very flexible in the sense that on the one hand, it can, it can provide us a picture of what's happening. It won't allow you to measure and to give one number like they try to do in the digital divide, but then why do we need one number that will tell us what? It will not be relevant anywhere, so. Yeah. Katie? I would like to follow up on this. If you look at um, maps of data, yeah. so there's one, um, um, artist in New York who does beautiful um, world processor globes, Ingo Günther, if you just type in world processor globes, you see a multitude of different types of data mapped onto our globe. And in all of those maps, you will see that there are some countries which have very, very detailed data on seismic hazards, for instance, Japan has beautiful data. And there are other countries which ba barely know anything about their kind of values for certain areas. And you will see this in any of the indexes. Uh, you will also see that there are many, many different views of our planet, and all of those are differently useful for different purposes. So I think what you might like to do is to have a multi-layered approach and a way to invite people to submit relevant data that's kind of like uh, the MapTube um, application I showed from Michael Batty's team, and then a way to 
locate it. And you could either geolocate it, but it might not be so relevant for the uh, internet map. I hope uh, you have a better map than what's on there, because that doesn't even have a, a legend. And no, that's it's simply, just tricky. Uh, that's simply I can. Um, <laughs> I, I think you could um, create a, a meaningful map of the internet, and you could then invite people to yeah. upload all the um, advantages which they had had in their personal lives out of the internet, and that would be one very interesting category. And then you have a lot about the hardware itself. You have a lot about the hardware and services which are running over those. You basically, like in a GIS kind of systems, you can turn on and off different layers, and you can even turn on two and you see how the services and the usage of the web impact each other. So I think creating a system which allows many people to annotate, to, to contribute data, to show uh, what they are doing with the internet would be most useful. How to in design the incentive structures that they actually go there and do this, that's the key issue here. And uh, there might be other people in the room which know more about incentive structure design than I do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Céline Rosenblatt from Switzerland. Uh, if we compare uh, with the classical uh, index like uh, uh, index of development of the countries, like GDP, for example, uh, everybody knew that, uh, that it was not enough to measure the development. And so people uh, proposed the human uh, development index. And maybe, uh, and now with this index, uh, I think that it's much better to see how people live in every country. And maybe in this, uh, in this spirit, maybe we could, uh, you could inspire of this kind of index of human development index to see how, for example, uh, uh, networks, internet, uh, div uh, support democracy, support well-being of people, uh, support development. Okay. I, see that I see that the, uh, th this is a sort of index, which if we did have it geographically, split out, then the sort of thing which somebody would uh, perhaps fold into a, uh, a general development index. Karen, you asked, you, you said, why should we have one number? I think one, uh, w having one number avoids a few, uh, uh, pe people s sometimes can cop out. If you have lots of numbers, then they will quote the number that, uh, that suits them. So for example, suppose there, there is one number for whether everybody in the, in the, w in the c country has got signal, and that number is 100 when you can get signal on the top of it, the nearest hill, wherever you are. And then the next number, uh, then there's another one which we throw in there, which is uh, whether uh, each of the towns is documented in the native language on Wikipedia or something, which is very much, you know, uh, or, and then we, so, so we have another thing which looks at whether there are, for example, both genders are particip participating in their native language in discussion. Now, and suppose, now, in order, so now I suppose we put those together, then, uh, then, it's, uh, for a country which has no co connectivity at all, you're motivating them because they can try and get some, uh, you know, assuming that the, there is a motivation to increase the number, then you motivate the, the, the lowest level countries. And could you, uh, she's dying for the, for the, for the mic. Uh, but, it, but you don't, if you have separate indices, then people, the, the, then people will quote the one that they've achieved. And without, without, without people coming back to say, well, why, you know, you've achieved all this, why are you only 30% on the web index? I then? didn't talk about different indices. You can have one indices without one number. The, the thing is, like, eventually if we get to the politics of creating the index itself, if you look at, for example, uh, the e-readiness uh, of the UN or UNESCO, uh, index. Basically, they have weights. Whoever decides about the weights of the different factors has a lot of power of basically deciding the, t the terms of the game. So what happens is that, that a lot of developing countries, instead of trying actually to be better in a certain aspect, what they are doing is actually they're starting to be uh, to try to exhibit that they are less in a certain subject because they want to get more money. If they are less in a certain subject, then they get more funds from the industrial countries. And we see that all over the board. So you get actually the opposite effect because you have a number to basically show how much you need. So that's why I said this is, this is, this is where you get to the politics of design. So right? This motivation. is all great stuff, by the way. Uh, the uh, really, yeah, yeah. really interesting. Um, I want to stay out of the politics, but, um, and, you know, it, to me, if, if you want to look at the web as a network and then ask the question, well, can we quantify what's there? Um, immediately, what comes to my mind are indices of centrality and centralization. Um, these things are old. Um, they go back to the 60s and 70s. 
Um, there are any number of indices of centrality. Um, they're all trying to achieve different substantive goals. Um, but there's no question that when you combine them to a single index to measure um, how egalitarian the net is or, or you know, the network that you're looking at or how centralized, meaning you know, one central figure and then everybody else is on the periphery, a very core periphery kind of structure, um, the indices of centralization really do work quite well. And there are various ways of normalizing them. Some of them are more statistical than others. And um, again, just looking at this from a mathematical, mm -hmm. statistical, mm -hmm. unpoliticized um, way, it would seem to me that the mathematicians and the statisticians that have been working in networks trying to quantify things, um, this would be a good approach to, okay. to Great. grab onto. Okay, Rob's got a point and then, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, just to follow on from the, the points that Corinne was, was making, it's, it's quite true about this, the politics of multi-dimensional, uh, or, or having several different indexes, but I think one thing that you could look to is the Millennium Development Goals, that, which is um, that the World Bank and the UN are, are pursuing, and that, that is, there, there are s several different uh, measures of human development that are, that are encompassed within the Millennium Development Goals, so any of these kind of issues that, that come up are probably being already dealt with, with the, in, in that context and, and, and you'll be able to learn from them. But just to get back to the, the power of a single number, um, I, I think there is a lot to be said for it if you can come up with a, a way of doing it. Um, and, and I keep on coming back to the index number theory, which is a, a subfield of economics that's been around for, I think, around 100 years or so. And, of course, the pinnacle achievement of that is the... Um, the Big Mac Index in the, in the Economist magazine, which is a, um, a single number of purchasing power parity um, you know, uh, across countries. But um, the question is, how how do you come up with a single number? And the way that uh, economists do it in the context of GDP measurement is that there's a scarce resource uh, that's, be, that, that's that's at the core of it. And in in, uh, in, in with GDP, it's it's money um, and, or, and budgets, and so that, that, and that leads to ways of aggregating across countries and over time. Um, and the question, you know, with a web index is what's the scarce resource and I think Richard's already mentioned it it's a, it's a tension uh, that that is the sort of the scarce resource or a scarce resource that, that could be used in some way to sort of ground or uh, a web index interesting okay yeah um, I, I would disagree with Stanley about not being political I, I think we have to be political because if we say we are not political we are uh, living in this world in which we imagine that having a number that goes up or down is the same. And we know that in terms of human perception, except for playing to try to get funds, growing is always good, right? <laughs> no one claims, hey, my GDP is going down, right? It's, I want to be yeah. healthier, taller, richer, wiser, right? So that when we make a decision about is the index growing because the system is getting more centralized or more decentralized, we are essentially making a political decision because it will be easier to justify that growth is good and you will want to grow. So, so from the start, we'll have to make a political decision about what do we think from our scientific knowledge, what is the good path? Where should this go? And, and if, if we are going to play this right, we should make this goal something that you grow to instead of decrease to? Well, okay. we can say, social scientists have made a lot of value statements which are not necessarily pointed out as being polit as political. So when you, you, you can talk about being, people being healthy when you, and, you can talk, uh, you know, and you can talk about measuring infant mortality. When you measure infant mortality, you're making an inference statement that, in, that, in, that, that their kid is dying is not a good idea. Uh, it doesn't have to be directly political in the sense that you can avoid, on a good day, aligning it directly with a political party, for example, as we know. Although, from uh, listening to the, uh, the talks yesterday, I should have more and more <laughs> cynical about that, perhaps. But I think probably what is more important to do for the index, though, is to make a yes, is to clearly make value judgments without, without ducking the fact that the value statements are being made. But then, not th then trying to be as a political, well, a, a party political, certainly about it as possible. Um, yeah, I, I think I would just 
have a remark on, on Stanley and, and Lewis. And I think it's a good idea to think about when and where to be political. And you can be political at wrong levels. You can be political at the very low levels of, of picking your indicators and measures and statistics. And you can be political at later levels of aggregation. And I think it's a good point to be maybe not political in the, in the lower levels, but have the goal in mind that this is the whole point. And I want to have this index to capture, I don't know, less centralized, more democratic, more kind of cross-disciplinary, whatever is the, is the value judgment, but not build that in into the, into the lower details. And of course, we have to be careful also not to be maybe unconscious that it, it is built in into the indicators at the lower level, so that's a good idea to be reflexive. Is, it, is this indicator and that indicator and this statistic um, carrying um, some kind of a political valence or right. kind of judgment built into it? But maybe better if, if it's not. And then we have the whole project with a, with a political goal in mind. Okay, excellent. Okay, I, I feel that we might hopefully move on to having aired that for 20 minutes. Um, the issue of, um, I get the sense that whether layered, but it's certainly multi-component, whether we aggregate to a single number to be determined. There seem to be quite a lot of view around that being a sensible thing. The, of course, the interesting thing is what can we measure? Uh, network topology, various aspects like that would seem to be uh, uh, up there. Um, some of these entirely obvious, um, and in no particular order, you know, having you know, um, access, penetration, censorship, type of use, economic activity, a whole range of stuff. Uh, but it would be really very good to have a sense of what people think are tractable uh, or whether there's existing prior art where, well, of course, there is a perfectly respectable way of measuring the degree of, if you will, um, censorship that's, uh, that's in place or the degree of uh, roughly the, the, the degree of deployment in, in e-government, for example. So um, thoughts around this, uh, what should we what should the dimensions in this multidimensional uh, space be? So I, I just wanted to ask, when you say there's a, that there exists a perfectly acceptable measure of censorship... I have no idea. No, oh, no, I, yeah, I, okay. I should have said no. I've okay, because <laughs> I was, okay, okay. was going to refer to the Open Net Initiative at the... Right. the yeah. The Berkman Centre and, and, um, and, and others who are involved in that, and that's... Uh, that's been a huge uh, effort over years, collecting data on uh, censorship across lots of countries, with with a view of producing basically a um, a league table of of country. And that they are they do at least the, their aim, I, I believe, was to reduce it to a single number to say, well, you know, this is the league table of countries, um, or sort of like a reverse league table in the sense of you know which countries are the worst in terms of censorship. But again, they ran into problems with regards to um, weighting material, because they have, I think, four or five different categories of m web material that, um, you, know, you know, there's the sexual content, sex content, there's the politically, politically oriented content, there's um, malware, um, but then at the end of the day, to come up with a single number for each country, they had to make a value judgment as, a as to which uh, weights to assign to each of those types of content that were being censored by the different countries. Do people happen to know whether that data the inputs to their index are, 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 are entirely open and available? No, they, they, at least when I tried to get the data, they weren't because they, quite reasonably they don't want to publish their, their, um, their list of uh, websites that they know are being censored in different countries because it might then lead to countries that are not censoring material saying, oh, okay, we've got to censor that. Um, so, um, but, it, but they do have lists and, uh, and, 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 and maybe it will be available to researchers, but um, at least when I tried, I wasn't able to get it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that, that I mean, if you wanted, uh, if anyone's interested in, in, in the, the index on internet censorship, uh, uh, I work on that project. I mean, I, what are the, but what are the issues around that in terms of, uh, this isn't a research project, this wants to be something ultimately which is out there and, and if we've got best of breed censorship data, for example. But you've got, you've got, so you've got, run, you know, these people have running systems uh, that they, they use yeah. volunteers who set up proxies in the various yeah. different countries. It's pretty valuable. I found that it didn't quite match what I found when going, when going to an international hotel, for example, in Saudi Arabia. I found like 
I found, for example, you listed that you couldn't get explicit, but you had explicitly uh, under Saudi Arabia, you can't get to Amnesty International. And I found that I could, but that was probably maybe I was in a I was in a different. But this is but this is only the censorship that you are basically doing while you are surfing. It doesn't really represent anything like in terms of the filterizing mm -hmm. tools that are being put in libraries, in schools, in education system, even in America. I mean, so so basically, uh, you get certain numbers about censorship, which goes to what Rob was saying. And then I'm, I'm I didn't see in this list the privacy issue. I think one of the most important people that people want to know is the privacy issue, which brings me to the question of how you're going to make one number because privacy, in some cases, is against um, access and against transparency. So so again, you'll have a lot of conflicting factors there. That in some cases they are working together, and in some cases they are basically conflicting each other. So um, so that goes back to the Hi. problem of measurement. Privacy is an interesting one. Uh, and I think I think of it as being part of the, the open web is that it, it, privacy. But how on earth do you measure it? Th that's what I'm, uh, not only how on earth, let's say that you could measure it. Let's, let's take an ideal type of a world that you could measure it. In many cases, when you provide privacy to people, you are basically providing it on the expense of, of reducing the transparency of access of information. A lot of time, take for example the WikiLeaks, right? One, one of the complaints about the WikiLeaks was that it exposes a lot of, of private information about people. So again, in order to measure privacy, you have to, to uh, kind of like compensate other kinds of rights that I'm, I'm seeing there. Yep. And I don't think that there is non-political, by the way, decision making. I think any, once we put values, it's political, in my opinion. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, look, please, please throw more thoughts in because this is just very partial. So, so you were saying pollution. Pollution. Like pollution of the traffic when you pollution of the traffic when you have you know sources producing malware, producing spamware, and no uh, service providers not cleaning that. So that that also in effect uh, limits the access of the of the people to to the web. Yeah, yeah. So Nigel, at the um, something we've discussed a little bit, but I thought I'd bring up to the group, is we've also talked about the difference between sort of the infrastructure kind of measures that are more or less measurable, I mean, again, to approximate percentage of the population with access to the web. Seems, seems much more possible to estimate in some ways than uh, how is the web doing with respect to education or things like that. So one of the things we've been looking for is where are, where are techniques to be found that help you figure out how to get from what can be measured. What are the right proxies for some of the kinds of things up here and stuff? So that's another question I think we're grappling with a lot, which is uh, if we can you know, get something that is countable, that helps. But of course, it's usually not talking to these issues. And how do you convert from one to the other is, is a real issue. Yeah. You said that there are a lot of things, with, uh, in fact, on the other on the other hand, the web is a place unlike the uh, supermarket. You know, if you if you're trying to model and make an index of how supermarkets are doing, you typically you have to go to supermarkets. The web is you know is so much more open to automatic measurement. So if the people can think of clever things which actually happen to be there. So for example, one one thing I I, I like to I like a, a number which is the correlation between the number of people who speak each language as a mother tongue, and the number of web pages in that language on the web. Now I'm not. Now I think probably an optimum. For, it's not optimum for the web that they're actually balanced exactly and they correlate exactly because probably it's better for the world that there are a few la languages like the UN languages which predominate and provide more connectivity. But but but, but you know, that sort of thing you can ask Google for that and they uh, and they've got those numbers in their back pocket. Uh, you could also build systems which would go out and uh, 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 and verify it. So if people can think of things which are actually very easy to measure on the web. I, I don't know whether... Uh, yep, good. Laszlo. No. I, mean, I mean, one issue actually that comes up here is that, yes, the web is open and you can measure anything you want in principle on it if you know how to do that. And I keep going back and thinking when I hear this to the Internet Archives, which was a wonderful approach, but it's never really managed to take off to the degree that it could have taken off because somehow they never managed to interface themselves with the research community. So there are a couple of researchers who were very successful of using that, 
but it didn't become a really wide open research tool. But you know, Barbara's journal has just published recently the Ngram paper about the Google Books, and that's so easy to use, and many of us are using it, and so on. So, so in a way, you know, I think what would be useful is an internet archive that is easy to use. <laughs> you know, uh, in the internet archive version that is really easy to use, that is like you know, big depositories of the current searches from web engine. And um, you may be thinking to talk with 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 whoever is doing the crawling today from Google to the other people, and put make it available in a way that researchers can use it, and yeah. you don't have to travel to internet archives and have to do all these yeah. different things, mm -hmm. but to be able to download the Absolutely. appropriate part and run your data mining on that. Just want a copy of the web and edit file. I think so, because all of these that we are talking about are really building on knowing the underlying structure and knowing the explicit, you know, who are the web pages, how they connect to that. And then once you have that skeleton, then you can build lots of measures on top of it. But right now we're still missing the skeleton. You know, we, we, we you know, how, how is, you know, Israel kind of built into the overall world wide web? You know, how is Hungary built into the debt? How does it correlate with economic indicators? We don't, and, and if there is no skeleton and the skeleton of the web is the structure, is the topology, is the, is the links and who is connected to whom and so on. Once we have that, I think it's much easier to dress it up in the different economic and so, so, social numbers. Without that, we're just measuring numbers, how they change in time. So you want the observatory, really? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, at least um, from my perspective, that's where the useful stuff could come from. Mm -hmm. OK, Stanley. Oh, Matthew, then Stanley. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Laszlo was saying about the Internet Archive, because that's something I've been working on now for about four years, trying to go through and create, map out map out the history of media organizations in particular and how they've been connecting through the Internet Archive. And that's an area where you know, there's an opportunity to, as you said, map out the history of these organizations and uh, the way that people have connected and used this technology as a basis for creating these indices. And the Internet Archive, um, just in recent conversations with them, are making some steps in releasing that data publicly. There are some steps forward towards an API that hopefully within the next couple of years would open up that data for researchers. I know Rob's been interested in that as well. Um, but the problem with the Internet Archive is that it's a sample and it's a, now today it's a relatively small sample of the amount of information that is out on the web. So that goes back to the indice in that maybe one thing that we need to be talking about is sampling and choosing yeah. the right subsegments of this data to be looking at. And of course that is a political decision, but when you start getting into things like looking at media coverage, looking at connectivity, you are talking about sampling potentially and taking a subset. Okay. Okay. I, I want to congratulate Laszlo for being such a good 21st century physicist and, and realizing that you need data. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Laszlo. And, and of course, the data that you need are, are, as he says, the skeleton data, the data really that give you the network that is behind the web. And once you have that, um, quantification, as, as I mentioned earlier, is, is relatively straightforward. And then you can get into all of the more complicated questions and are we really measuring access penetration, censorship type of use, blah, 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 blah. But, but, but first you have to have the data. First you have to understand the connectivity and it really does come down to network science. I'm a little bit worried that, uh, <laughs> that uh, so yeah, okay, so you're network scientists and we ask you about a Windex and say, by the way, if you're making Windex, win 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 could we have, please, the entire network? I bet if we go and talk to linguists, they'll say, oh, could we have all the words, please? You know, and then we, we, and then we will, no, there's a lot of them and the network's quite big. So uh, maybe the art of, of building an index is to make some surgical incisions in particular places which involve a finite amount of data. Yeah, okay, interesting. Yeah. So, so I actually have the, a question for the two of you, yeah. and which is about which way do you want to go about this? Do you want to sort of only go out with it once you have sort of a really, really, really good index that measures high level things, or, or do you want to start going with some indexes that are already very useful? I mean, 
how many people have access to the web yeah. is not very useful for the United States, but yeah. there are many, many countries in which getting an idea where things are going would yeah. be very useful. Yeah. Yeah. And so the point is, that where, where, where is the target? Is it going to be, are we going for the big bang or are we going to have little bangs along the way that will give experience, create a track record, yeah. and actually be useful uh, to many communities? Uh, I think, I, I don't know if that's up for grabs, but I would be disinclined to wait until we have the perfect index, uh, A. B, I would be very disinclined to come out with any index which starts off by talking about internet access. Because it's really important that we put this as being web. So what's interesting here is at the content level, or at the so ideally at the social interaction level, and because we wanted, because lots of, that when 99% of the world don't actually know the difference between the web and the internet, so <laughs> sort of, that would be a huge trap to fall in. Uh, the only other comment would be when you say that, by the way, you know, access to the internet is, not, uh, is obviously not useful for America, Maybe we should get, make that because, in fact, in America, because because there's an assumption out there that um, that, for example, data that that that, uh, that internet access is uh, universally accept uh, available in America. It's my I, I think data access on a phone is probably more. Of a, I wouldn't be surprised if you told me that Uganda had a better penetration per per, per capita than the U S. Or, or or per square mile. No, uh, because. So, so uh, not, and the U.S. has a lot of poor, and it has a lot of illiter uh, illiterate people. So, I wouldn't okay. assume that the, U the, the, the U.S. is going to store 100 on any of these indices. So, perpetual beta probably is what I'm hearing uh, for the index, uh, Jeff. Okay, my um, my fundamental question for this whole discussion, actually, and I may be just missing something, but what is the use case or a use case for the web index? Like, that to me would be um, help me clarify. Uh, for instance, like uh, part of the discussion seems to be uh, leaning toward a number that would be sort of the index for the web, and then other times I'm hearing that you're looking for a number that would each nation would be measured for each nation, and then that would be a comparative tool to to look at some sort of social. I, I can I can imagine different use cases for that, but I guess I'm very curious as as the leaders of this effort, um, what is the use case that you see it being, um, or a use case that you see this tool being. Um, particularly good for? Change, mm -hmm. letting people see things, put, put things in perspective. So yeah, it's, it's a huge, so if you like, <coughs> borderline p political statement when you say that we're going to wait this three <laughs> and we're going to wait this one. Um, but it means that, yes, I think it's useful for on the countrywide, but also generally, when you know, somebody gets up in the, on, on, on Monday morning, they've just retired, and they're thinking, what should I spend the next week doing? Uh, if the, I think it's useful if the index, not a, it says that currently the web, web, web index is 684420, and a critical thing where it's hurting, which, you know, which needs attention, is this. That's going to be different country by country and region by region to the extent that things are, are, are geographic. <laughs> But of course, things that when you look at particular languages, when you look at the uh, lack of uh, the Latin languages and out there, you know, for example, then that's the, uh, the may, may, maybe also that. So it may, maybe also we're going to take allow different NGOs maybe to help you know, help them justify the, uh, their priorities, uh, help people uh, help lift people above this idea that all you need to do is get internet. To, is to get signal to somebody, and then they will be oh, members of the information society. Uh, a great, you know, uh, that if I had to, I suppose, yeah, if I had to summarize from one, that, one sentence, it would be that help uh, stop people thinking that if all you have to do is to get signal to make somebody a member, a full member of the internet society, uh, of the connected society. I think it's an interesting project, and it sort of looks at, it seems like the goal is to sort of engineer the web from instead of the engineering that the World Wide Web Consortium does of like literally engineering the net, you're sort of looking at a social yeah. pressure to engineer the net from the outside. So it, I think it, it's a very it, interesting it's, project. It's to promote it for the social good. I mean, it's a very kind of highfalutin sound of ambition, but I think that's exactly what's behind the foundation's mission here. <coughs> yeah. uh, it, just uh, one quick, uh, during the uh, Iraq war, um, we studied the Iraq web to just try to get an indication of what was going on on the ground. So like we used the Iraq web as a proxy for the health of Iraqi society. And what we found was that all the university web, that the Iraq web was broken. 
that all the university websites were down, all the hospital websites were down, and the only um, active um, portion of the Iraqi web was the oil websites. So all those were flourishing. So then we, we, we decided that, okay, so maybe we could measure the state of a society on the basis of the state of their web. Yeah, so, 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 um, so then we created all these indicators. So how fresh are the websites? How, are they broken? So we used link validators. Yeah. Are they cohesive? Are they linking to other yeah. national sites? Are they, are they dated as the software that they're using? Are there old software running on the websites? Uh, and the users, are they, are they dated users? What browser versions, et cetera. So we created like a sort of, the, we created the basis for a kind of nation, national um, national web health uh, index. Very interesting. It sounds really, yeah. yeah we should talk, we should talk, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, and with uh, some 20 minutes to run, um, well, the how, I mean, we've been touching on this a little bit. Um, um, who should we be talking to? Um, um, actually, one, of course, that relates to here is... Um, how do we maintain uh, any of these particular measures that we go after? Um, how do we aggregate them? So uh, experience around the whole issue, what well, sounds like it's partly a political issue of, of waiting and who gets to kind of even make those calls or how do you, some of this is process I suspect, how do you set up what is seen to be a transparent and fair process to even um, argue these sorts of issues? Um, the, um, the other issue, the other hows have to do with uh, um, I assume we imagine this is continuous, or do effective indices kind of come up with a state of stated index at the end of a quarter or monthly? Or I, I don't know what what, what best we, we don't know what best practice is there. Um, th this other crucial thing is that um, how how do we deal? I think this is really interesting with 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 the continuing evolution of the web. The fact that at any one time uh, there may appear to be only one social network of, um, of relevance in a particular geographic region, but that can change, can be contested, can move on, or indeed whole new media become available and become important to understand in terms of their impact. And um, I'm always very struck when I look at the Chinese context, how very, very different uh, uh, some of the uh, basic uh, facts on the ground, the data is. Um, and in that case, should we worry that we can't usefully take the index of 2012 whenever it's launched and hope to be able to compare it meaningfully with 2020? So, I mean, I, again, just thought, thoughts around the issues of the how uh, would be a final, perhaps, thing to close out on. <coughs> Methodologically, what do we need to be aware of, uh, worry about? Nobody knows how to do the how. Yeah, Rob does. <laughs> <laughs> By the, by the way, I, I did my PhD in economics on index number theory, so this is why I've got them. No. <laughs> this is why I'm, I'm very uh, interested in this. Um, just in terms of, you, you mentioned about um, continuous estimate. I mean, the, the reason why, for example, uh, GDP per capita estimates only come out, well, actually, the, the ones that are used for uh, international development work, which is through the International Comparisons Project, they're only every five years or so because it's a hugely costly data data collection exercise and to the extent that this is going to be leveraging uh, data that's on the web and, 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 and data that is that are easily more easily accessible than yeah, a, a, a more continuous I wouldn't say you need to constrain yourself to, to going quarterly um, or yearly if you can actually do something uh, on a daily that's basis it. or a weekly basis because but that's it, what you want to notice isn't it if it's yeah, changing literally ex exactly week yeah, it's going to be yeah. really powerful um, yeah um, I've got lots of other ideas but um, I just getting back to the idea of being able to aggregate across different web content it's just so difficult because um, you know, it gets back to that idea that you know one one person's or one country's terrorist group is another another country's um, you know freedom fighter group. You know, um, and uh, when I was I, I was at an Open Net initiative conference in in um, at Oxford in 2007, and we're, they were talking about this censorship index, and I, I I made a suggestion that maybe they should look at linking it in with what's being done with. Um, uh, um, um, 
carbon trading schemes and trying to come up with a price for, for carbon em emission. And so if they could come up with a price for, uh, um, for censorship, and so they, they would, their countries or, or different actors would actually be voting or um, trying, to, trying to come up with a pricing system for uh, keeping certain types of content freely available on the web. And so therefore the, the price of, say, uh, internet porn would be close to zero because you know people a lot of a lot of people don't really or say child pornography no one wants to kind of uh, um, you know keep that on the web but um, the price of other types of material that's um, like politically sensitive content you know there are some countries who who want that censored while there are other countries that want it free um, and so the really the only way to kind of um, figure out is, is to have some sort of pricing mechanism system you know to actually value the free the, the openness of this or the, the that, that uh, put some value on this content being freely av available. Um, and so I just thought that maybe that, that could also feed into this type of an inks, because you've got to come up with some sort of value judgment about the, all the different types of content that's on the web if you're gonna come up with a single number for a, a web index. How, how do you keep a process like that transparent? I mean, transparency of, of those decisions? Uh, well, I, mean, I, I don't know, maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know whether it's a, it's a red herring, but I mean, just, this, you know, it, it, what's being done with carbon tr trading schemes um, in, in various countries, um, you know, th there are these, you know, uh, industries... They're being sold in, in, illegally, aren't they? I mean, that's what's happening. I, I don't know. No, but I, I, all I know is in Australia, they've, they've since recently turned away from the idea. But I mean, the idea is that um, industries that want to pollute, they'll, they'll pay to pollute, um, or they'll, they'll buy out the credits um, from other industries that, that are, that are uh, more naturally green. And so therefore, you get a more efficient allocation of pollution uh, sort of make uh, production, and, and, and as a result, over time, you get less pollution. And so, so I you guess... So you've got censorship and privacy should be deal done by, by cap and trade? This is... Uh, yeah, uh, when I suggested that the Open Net Initiative, they, they were banged for my blood by the end of it, yeah. But I was just saying that they had a fundamental problem, was that they, they were trying to come up with an index, a, a ranking of countries, on, uh, who were the worst... Censor, censorship countries in, in the same way as you could say well who are the worst polluters and but they had no way of doing it in using a scientific process because they had to make a value judgment on the different types of content that are, that are on the web that, are, that, that various countries are wanting to censor and so it was basically them imposing their judgment on on on, on what type of content should be or shouldn't be censored and, and, it, and it led to a, 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 an index that I thought was unscientific and so that's the suggestion I made. Um, some people actually, I could see they thought it was quite an interesting idea, but then, but then very quickly, yeah, as I said, the audience turned against me. <laughs> I think there's some things, uh, uh, the danger, when you start talking about the value of this information, then for example, in an open data area, yeah. then uh, the, the, the natural way to find out how much, for example, the mapping data in England uh, is worth is by charging people for it. And they've been doing it for ages. And, uh, and, but in fact, then, but, but there are lots of analyses, uh, Rufus Pollock's analyses, where actually the value to the country is a whole lot more by making it completely free. Uh, but when you, but there's no, but it's very, very difficult to measure that return on investment. Uh, there, are, there are a bunch of things like that, like the web. What's the return on investment of the web? Mm. It's been 20 years now. You should have measured it. Okay. So if you come back to me with a with a figure for return on investment of, uh, of the web, then I'll be more inclined to take sort of a, a, a return on investment figures and you know, look at uh, in storage in economic values are at data in general, but other things like uh, human rights, access, you know, the right to talk to whoever you want, uh, the right to, you know, to, to be able to communicate, the right not to be, uh, to be cut off from members of your family as a punishment. You know, it's like, the, uh, I, don't think that I don't think that dollars really work for that. Yeah, but if you're wanting to quantify it and do it in a meaningful way across countries, then you have to have some scientific way of, of actually measuring. And, 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 and uh, it's, you know, my, my, my own country, Australia, w is, is on the top, you know, it's quite high up in the list of uh, countries that the ONI are, are concerned about, the Open Net Initiative, because we're actually trialling a, f a filter, an internet filter in Australia. Um, so it's just interesting, you know, it, it, uh, it, it's, not, it's not just the, you know, the, the, you know, the countries that you would, you would typically expect are in, are in the cross, you know, the, the cross sites, um, you know, the countries like Australia as well, because, you know, they, they are investigating a, a filter in Australia. So any more thoughts on, on how? Yes. Open data. Open data, open, data, open code. Hmm. Yes, that would be nice. That would be nice. There is some talk about, of course, uh, somebody mentioned the point, is that, that a lot of the data we want is the kind of data that sits in Yahoo and Google and such like. And the 
interesting thing, not just for this exercise, but for web science in general, is the kind of, res the kind of compacts we will need to make with the people who hold an awful lot of the structural signatures we want. Um, The Internet Archive too. Yeah, indeed, 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 indeed. Okay. Um, the the uh, the other the thing about process. Uh, one thing we're keen to do is understand uh, what kind of mix of disciplines we need to keep us straight on this too. Um, some of them are in this room clearly. Um, we will be wanting. I think you know this is very much an initial brainstorming uh, session. We've got uh, a requirement to kind of take this on and develop it. Um, so we will be certainly looking to try and encourage and incorporate more um, discussion around this. Uh, I suppose that in some sense there's still this thought that we won't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And so what we put up there, though, needs to be something which isn't risible, that there is some sense. Um, and uh, again, I don't know, would it be better to go for something which is somewhat more limited in scope and grow it out initially than to try and boil the ocean at this point. People's thoughts on that. People nodding, but um, yes. Okay. Jim, do you want to add anything into this at this point from your seat in the stalls? Well, I think the, um, you know, again, the way I see it is there, there's really several different parts of this. One is what can we do now one is, what would we like to do now that we can't, and what do we need to put in place to get that there? So I, I, you know, my role outside the Web Foundation, I'm not a Web Foundation leader. I'm looking at this from a very different perspective. You know, how it's going to motivate research that's critical to making that thing more powerful in the future. And our understanding of the web really goes hand in hand with this. Just as an example, um, Egypt turned off their web as part of their things. Libya did it later. L Libya did it sort of the the hand handed the the ham handed way that anyone who understands the web would be the obvious way to turn off the web in your country. Egypt did it a much more subtle way that shows they had been planning it for a long time, right? At least that's what it seems like when you look at this. So the more we understand this stuff, the more we can not only get at you know, they did this, they did this, but how and where and what should we be measuring and how do we look at these things? So, so again, if you think about instrumenting the web for this, what do we need to develop? What do we need to do? So those are some issues that don't come out so much in the what can we do in the research, what, what can we do in the index short term, but I think long term, you know, there's also a lot in here and I don't really have anything to say about it except to say I think it's interesting. I think the research community in sort of the web science world can be really engaged with that because it really is a place where all these factors from the network up to the social come together. Okay, okay. And in terms of sampling these very large networks, which is a point, just a final point to, uh, methodologically, which is if we want to understand how uh, Hungary is differently in or out of the web in its various manifestations as opposed to Chile or wherever, um, Again, do we have a mature enough sense of how to go in and do a fair job of pulling out subsets of the information we're after, rather than having to incorporate trillions of uh, pages or links at this point? Is that, are we confident about that? What's wrong with incorporating, incorporating trillions of pages? Well, maybe, I mean, maybe. Is there, I, I, this is actually a, a question. Is there a limitation of how much can be stored and made available? And if there is such, maybe we should discuss that. Because my attitude towards that is a good source is the one that doesn't make selection itself. Yeah. And let us make the selection of what we need, typically. Yeah. Once, you make, once you make the selection, you're biasing the data towards your needs and your vision, and maybe that moment is useless for us or for somebody else. So if there are limitations, technical ones, we need to know that, obviously. Sorry. Uh, so. <laughs> You've made, so making this, uh, push again that we should the, the makers of the Windex should also should make a huge uh, a, a copy of the network and make it available. Uh, so okay then, if you had the as, as opposed to just for example going to the government and seeing if they had a nice website, going to each school and seeing if they have a nice website, and finding out whether people are tweeting in the language of, <laughs> in the mother tongue language, uh, you know, which are which are sort of things you could do on the back of an envelope you know, uh, with a relatively small team. So what? Uh, then, so t t so tempt me, tempt if we, you were to have the, uh, uh, a database with a snapshot of the uh, uh, of the skeleton of the web, 
what sorts of things would you then expect? What, what would you feed into the web index from that? I mean, in the moment where I have uh, essentially the underlying network, and that's properly indexed, so I know that that node is not just node number 35, but it's actually, let's say, the, the Northwestern University's website and things like that, then all these ideas that people have about you know, pro research productivity to, uh, to income level in the particular neighborhood that if it's geotagged, can be now associated with the network topology. And that's what we're really talking about in the way, because on one end, the structure of the network itself reflects the particular economic and social conditions exist in a certain region, whether it's academia or country or, or, or region. And, and the other one is that anything you measure is really on that structure. So in a way, when it comes to the World Wide Web, our space is not the Google map anymore, but the underlying network topology. How we will be able to use it depends on the skills of the particular researchers. And if we don't have that roadmap, which is the underlying t topology, then as I said, you know, we're measuring numbers and that's good. That can be very useful. GDP is a very useful number and so on. Uh, what sort of, sorts of things would you extract? Can you imagine in your dreams, if you had very skilled researchers, what sort of numbers would you extract from the network topology? Uh, you know, cohesiveness of the community, of the network science community in the U.S. versus in, uh, you know, versus in Colombia, if there is so such this a is thing. for general web index. So, <laughs> so, so Col uh, Colombia. I mean, you know, I mean, that, that would be one of that. If you get, for example, Cathy's list of 1,500, uh, you know, papers that were published in a particular area, try to code it onto the network and say, you know, how interconnected these people are. So the issue is that I think that the imagination of individuals is unlimited once you have the data. <laughs> you know, right well, now, we don't have the data. We have a couple of wonderful maps that the URESCO has put out that is available to us, but I believe it's kind of anonymous in a sense that we don't really know who the links are. I have to double check that. And we all feed on that. And it would not be sufficient to have one, one snapshot. I think you know, there has to be an effort to have several snapshots as it changes, because that will be exactly the type okay, of Okay, we're going to round out one last sure. uh, point. All I want to do is, is echo what Laszlo said, and that is these indices of cohesion and centrality, I mean, there are many of these things. They are the Okay, great. Okay, well, look, thank you very, very much for this. It's been very helpful. It's, it's really a dialogue at this point. Um, this was to canvas a set of insights that are really going to help inform the Web Foundation team as it tries to struggle to put this project together. Um, I can see one or two people who have very ex extensive and uh, deep knowledge of these issues uh, who can expect to be uh, contacted, if that is okay. And we'll put the notes of this out, of course. Uh, anybody who does want to um, uh, be involved uh, will provide a, a, a contact point for you to kind of pitch in your ideas. Um, in the meantime, um, um, use me as a surrogate to, if there's any immediate things you want to, uh, to, to kind of volunteer up. Tim, anything? No? Okay, cool. And then I think we're gonna close out. Thank you, pleasure.